thinking about this story I read this, this past week. We have every reason to praise the Lord. Sometimes in the midst of it, we don't see it. It's hard to see the reason. And I was reading some of the uh, biography of Corey Ten Boom, who her and her sister were held in a concentration camp by Nazi Germany. And they had been moved to new quarters and um, these quarters were just some of the worst in the whole uh, complex. And um, what was so just unnerving for them were that these quarters were just flea infested. And um, Corey was having a very hard time with that. And so they, her and her sister and a couple others that were believers began uh, to have their time together and her sister asked Corey would you give thanks and and she just couldn't she was just so frustrated with the situation and having a hard time seeing anything to give thanks for in those dire conditions and sometime later they began to realize that of all the quarters that one the worst flea infested place was the very reason that the guards never came. And they were able freely to have Bible studies and to sing and to pray together because of the fleas. And I thought, those little bitty fleas and being able to be at liberty and free to fellowship with the Lord and share and enjoy their faith together. Isn't that an interesting story? But they were hard to, hard to see the blessing of a bunch of fleas, right? It's hard to see. Anyway, let's see what you
Ladies, can we offer the Lady of the Old Testament, Leviticus 2730? And all the time of the land is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And from Malachi 310. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. There may be food in my house. And try me now in this, is the Lord of hosts. I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, as I give in today's offering, I affirm that all of the tithe belongs to the Lord and, is, and it is holy. I have willingly set aside the sacred part of my income according to his word, and by faith and obedience, and now bring my tithe into the storehouse, my local church. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
The, the portion of God's Word this morning that we will be occupying our time with is found in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. So uh, you're going to have to dig around in your Bibles to find Habakkuk. It's been, hasn't, it's been a while since you were there, and I see the little dust pockets coming up out there where uh, you have not been for some time. But as you're turning to Habakkuk, I want to take a moment and say thank you so much to Alan and Janelle uh, Adams and their family. Thank you to Dell and uh, Lehman and to Dawn as well who helped us yesterday. Thank you to Walt and the help he gave us. 
uh, we managed to, uh, right at the last, probably before the snow flies, I wouldn't be surprised this week, but we got the leaves yesterday. So uh, they're all done, and the campus is ready for a blanket of snow. So uh, winter is on its way. His name meant to wrestle or to embrace. And in his Old Testament book, just the three chapters that we have, he does both. He wrestles with God. And um, I was trying to think of an illustration that would illustrate how this book strikes me. And uh, I was picturing the times where Kathy and I were maybe on a trip or driving through Spokane or someplace. Have you ever experienced this? Where the car in front of you the couple are having an argument. And you can tell that those that, that couple, they're quite animated. And uh, you can see her hands fly up every once in a while, and you see him raise his hands, and you wish he'd keep them on the wheel where they belong, or he, or he whacks the wheel a couple times in frustration, and they're going back and forth. Have you experienced that? Yeah, of course, you've never done that, but you've, you've seen it done by others. Anyway, that wrestling, that, con that conflicted state is very much the flavor of this Old Testament book of Habakkuk. This godly prophet, and he was a godly prophet, and a seer who could see far more than his contemporaries could. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah, and he lived in the 6th century BC. And in this book, it begins with his frustration with God. And he is lifting his voice to God, and he's basically saying, Lord, how long are you going to put up with this? And the nation of Israel and Judah in particular had become an immoral people. They'd become an idolatrous people. There was uh, violence in the land and there was greed in the land and there was all kinds of backhanded behavior going on in the land. So his own people was his frustration to start with and he lifts his cry to God, how long, Lord? Will you allow your own people to live in such a lawless way? And then, to his shock, God responds to him. And he says, I'm going to do something that even if you heard ahead of time, you wouldn't believe it. And then he goes on to tell them that what I am going to do to discipline my people is I'm going to, like a hook in the, in the jaw of Babylon, the Chaldeans, I'm going to drag them to Israel, and they're going to come, and their hordes, and their armies, and they're going to invade the land. And they're going to come through, and they're going to take village after village after village. And, and of course, in those days, there was no such thing as the Geneva Convention. Warfare was ruthless, and relentless, and was cruel. And they were going to sweep down through Israel, sacking village and city after city until they came to Jerusalem. And even Jerusalem would fall. And all of this takes place, but not right away. It's that the prophet Habakkuk gets this answer from God, and now he has another problem. Wait, Lord. How can you take a people more wicked than we are and use them to discipline us. That can't be. And then God goes on and talks to his prophet and tells him, oh yes, it not only can be, it's going to be. So you need to get this settled in your mind. And so Habakkuk goes through this back and forth with the Lord. And finally it comes to the third chapter where his prayer is expressed. And at the end of his prayer, in verse 16, 
before we actually look at the text that we're going to look at. In verse 16, he ends his prayer in this way, recognizing the inevitability that everything God has said he will bring is going to come to pass. And he says, I heard, and my inward parts <laughs> trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay entered my bones, and in my place I tremble, he says, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who are going to invade us. And so here's the prophet, Habakkuk, this dear godly prophet who now realizes, you see, most of the prophets gave forewarnings. They, they said, this is our condition, but if you'll repent, God has promised that he will turn things around and things will be okay. Uh, that's not in Habakkuk. Habakkuk has no, uh, no place for a turnaround. There's no repentance included in it, except for the cry of his heart that, Lord, you would revive us one day. But at least for now, the prophet just has to wait and tremble and be gripped with the reality of the hardships that are coming. Okay, Pastor Tony, this is Thanksgiving week. What's with a message like this? Well, because the prophet's response is just precious beyond words. And it's one of the most beautiful expressions of trust and faith and thanksgiving and worship that we find anywhere in the scriptures. His response to it all is just incredible. And that's what I want us to see this morning. And so we are looking at the last three verses of this chapter. <laughs> this was last night about 10 o'clock. <laughs> and I said, Kath, it's okay, let's just go with it. Because um, I, you know, the title of the message is the last thing. You know, you don't title a message and then try to build from that. You think through your whole message and where your heart and mind has been as you've wrestled with the text. And by the end, you give the title. Well, I just couldn't come up with it last night. And so that's it right there. That's, Kath, that's Kathy's editorial comment. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's not my title that's important. What's important is the Word of God. Amen. Right? Amen. What God says. And so here we are. Look at verses 17 through 19. And here is the prophet's response. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine, Though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the, from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. What's he looking at? He's looking at that time when the dust settles and the mighty hordes of the Babylonian armies have come through the land and they have taken everything of value. They've taken the food, the crops, the livestock. They've taken everything. And here we are. With an economy that is completely collapsed and provisions that have dried up because they've been seized by the Babylonians. And then verse 18 says, Yet, yet I will exult in the Lord. The prophet says, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on my high places. For the choir director on my stringed instruments, and for the generations to come, coming out of that distressing time, 
are these beautiful words of trust in the sovereign God who controls my life and my circumstances. And um, so today, we're just going to look at this. Each verse, We have three points because there are three verses. And the first, first thing I'd like you to see with me is, is the scope and the size of his circumstances. The scope is the whole land of Israel. And the scope is this massive and cruel invading army that's going to come. And he's, they're going to sweep down through the land and strip it bare. And the people that he has been pleading with for years to turn back to the Lord, now they'll know that he told the truth. And Jeremiah will be left there in Jerusalem to serve. Ezekiel will be carried off and he'll serve in Babylon. And the godly Daniel, God will take but in his hand, take him in the deportation, take him to Babylon, where Daniel himself will rise. The Hebrew youngster will rise to prime minister of all of them. What a story the Bible is. What rich history the Bible is. Filled with the sovereign wisdom of God, working behind the scenes, not only of nations internationally, but working behind the scenes of your life and mine in ways that we don't understand and that we can't possibly see at the time that it's happening. And yet, in his goodness and in his wisdom, he's at work in our lives and behind the scenes. And we are called upon to trust. In this great book, we have the first statement, the just or the righteous shall live by what? Faith. Faith. And then three more times in Romans 1 and Galatians 3 and chapter 10 of Hebrews, three more times in the New Testament, that great principle that characterizes the people of God, these are my choice people, God says, and they don't live by sight or their own understanding. They live by faith. They are justified by faith. Romans 5 verse 1. They are sustained by faith. Galatians chapter 3. We live by faith. And then they, they are included then in a great train of, of the faithful who have trusted the Lord down through the Old Testament, clear into the New, and now from our vantage point, 2,000 years of church history of the people of God who have lived by faith. The scope was vast, but how can we miss the side? We talked about this a little bit in our adult class this morning. Because we are people of faith doesn't mean we never sigh. Doesn't mean we never groan. Doesn't mean we ever wring our hands and think, Lord, I can't see what you're up to. And I can't see what's around the corner. We do sigh. And the prophet is sighing here. And it starts with three, three little stanzas and they all begin with Though. Let me ask you, brother and sister, have you found that in your journey of faith, as you have walked with the Lord year after year after year, have you found and discovered in your own life the ebb and flow? Have you not discovered that there's a though and a yet in your Christian life? That's what we have in this text. What's he really saying? Well, in spite of the fact, that's what he means by though, in spite of the fact that there are no figs, no fruit, the fields and the food gone, the flocks and the folds, all of it, he says, yet, 
yet I will exalt in the Lord. It's a deep sigh. It's not shallow. And this man, Habakkuk, is not a shallow man. He's not, oh, well, praise the Lord. That's not the kind of man Habakkuk is. This is a deep man of God who was troubled with the moral, spiritual condition of Israel. And now is even more troubled because God has, God's solution baffles his mind. That your solution to this is this? You've got to be kidding. But it is. And he's come to the place of moving from wrestling, because that's what Habakkuk means, to wrestle, to embrace. And now he's embraced the purpose of God. He's embraced it, and he sighs and realizes. This is inevitable. What a situation for this prophet to be. The second that I want you to see, to me, the shock and surprise of his confession. Verse 8, 18. Yet, he says. Yet. And, you know, we get sometimes we get way, way too sentimental about our, our faith and sentimental about our Christian life. When I read, yet I will exult in the Lord, I read something that's gutsy. There's grit in this yet. Lord, I will trust you. After the Babylonians sweep through our country and leave us with little to nothing. Yet, Lord, if you are the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, you are my God, and I will trust you no matter what. You see what I'm saying? There's guts in this faith. There's grit in this faith. There's fortitude in his faith. Yet, I will exult in the Lord, he says. And I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. You ever been in a situation where it just seems like on every side, things are just not working out. They're not working out on this side or that side. They don't seem to be working out behind me or in front of me. In fact, the bottom almost feels like it's about to drop out. How sweet it must be to the heart of God when he hears you in such circumstances be able to say, yeah. Yet, I will exult in the God of my salvation. I will rejoice, Lord, in you, because you have me in your hands. That's where, that's where Habakkuk is. So there is this ebb and flow. This even though and yet. <laughs> yet. Right? Thirdly, then, not only the scope and sigh of the circumstances and the shock and surprise of this confession. And by the way, a confession that this old unbelieving world will never understand. <laughs> How could they understand? Verse 18. There's no way. In verse 19, then, the source and secret of his confidence. Look at it there. Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. It was in the spring of 1980. I'd only known the Lord for about two years. And I found myself in Bible College. And there I was, spring of 1980, sitting in a chapel by myself, with my Bible open, listening to somebody I'd never heard of. And it was the first time I ever heard him. 
and it would be the last time I ever heard him. His name was Malcolm Cronk, C-R-O-N-K, Malcolm Cronk. And, and he was deep, but also passionate as he shared the word of God. And I was listening. And then I found myself out on the edge of my seat, holding on to the seat in front of me, listening. I set my Bible aside because he was just captivating as I listened to Dr. Cronk deliver this message. And he made one assertion right in the middle of the message. And you know how things, I don't know why the Lord works this way, but sometimes you hear something at a specific strategic moment in your life and you never forget it. This was 1980. And I remember exactly what he said. And he said this. The most important thing about you is what you're looking at. The most important thing about you is what you're looking at. And in its context, of course, he meant focused upon the Lord. And that stuck with me. And I can't tell you in 40-something years now, 44 years, how many times that assertion has stabilized me and helped me. And that's exactly what's happened in the heart of Habakkuk the prophet. With all that God has told him and revealed to him, and now here he is. And he says, the Lord God is my strength. It's not even just that he gives me strength. That's wonderful in itself, isn't it? But he says, no, he doesn't just give me strength. He is my strength. Knowing him, trusting him, leaning on him, he is my strength. And we find a count a parallel, don't we, in the New Testament where Paul says that God has taught me to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I've learned to have plenty. I've learned to go without. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of contentment. How? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he strengthened me by his very presence. And so Habakkuk was looking upon the Lord and seeing him in his goodness and his faithfulness and his sovereignty and realizing, Lord, my life's in your hands. And I will exult in you I will trust in you. My heart will be grateful to you. And so, Habakkuk looked upon the Lord and he went, think about it, he went from empty shelves to an exulting spirit. He went from depleted resources to this deep, gritty rejoicing. He went from his own weakness, his own weakness to God's strength. He went from his shaky steps and his trembling knees to sure-footed security. Sure-footed. That's what he's doing with the metaphor. You notice that? He has made my feet like hinds. How many of us have been up Boulder Mountain or been way up in the woods somewhere and spooked one of those big old mule deer bucks and watched them thrash their way up the steepest, I mean, you couldn't even get up there, We're bounding, and they seem so light-footed and sure-footed as they go up through these rocks and crevices and, and disappear, and they're so sure-footed. And he says, Lord, you've made my feet like that as I look to you. And if that weren't enough, you've taken me from 
the worst of hardships to high places, to a perspective only you could give, as I lean and trust on you. What an incredible book this is, Habakkuk. What a message it has for us this Thanksgiving season. That there is something to be thankful for. Amen. Is it a flea infested environment that keeps the guards away so we can study the Bible and sing songs? God is in it. You notice there that quote, and I'm going to turn to it. This quote by uh, Spurgeon in the, in the bulletin on the right hand side. It is a wise heart that is thankful for the little things as well as the more significant. Spurgeon wrote of seeing God in the trifles of our journey of faith. And then he writes this. You will find it exceedingly helpful and consoling if you discover God in your trifles. We don't use that term that much, but you know what it means. Our life is made up of trifles. And if we had a God only for the great things and not for the little things, we should be miserable <coughs> indeed. There is a God, and I love this, there's a God in emotion of a grain of dust blown by the summer wind as much as in the revolutions of the mighty planets. There is a God in the sparkling of a, of a firefly as truly as in a flame cock. I beseech you, Spurgeon says, recognize the doing and being of God in every little thing. In every little thing. I want to end with this. Some people wrote Dr. Earl Rodmacher, one of my past seminary professors, who said, some people believe that human beings should never question the ways of God. Some even feel that it borders on sin to ask God why. But the book of Habakkuk counters that idea. It is filled with a prophet's perplexing questions and the Lord's penetrating answers. Habakkuk was not unlike many people today who are troubled by the world around them. They too sometimes wonder, where is God? Why doesn't he do something about the pain and the suffering, the injustice and oppression, the wars, the diseases that destroy humanity? Is he there? Why doesn't he speak? Is he powerful? Why doesn't he act? Is he loving? Why doesn't he intervene? Habakkuk shows that questions like these are as old as the seventh century. Brothers and sisters, God can handle your questions. He won't be thrown a curve at all. As high as the heavens are above the earth, my little Tony, so far are my thoughts above your thoughts and your ways above my thoughts. I can handle your confusion. I can handle your questions. Let me answer those for you in time. As we finish up this morning, I'd like to, if you would humor me, <laughs> if you would humor me just a little bit, I love the metaphors that are found in the Word of God. One of my favorite, of course, is John chapter 10, one that we just <laughs> memorize. My sheep, Jesus said, hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow. And I give to them eternal life. 
and no one shall snatch them from my hand. And my Father, who gave them to me, who is greater than all, no one can snatch them from my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. One in design, one in the essence, one in nature, distinct in persons, but we are one in purpose and plan for your life. I wonder if you just humor me for a moment. Would you cup your hands like this with me? You don't have to, but if, if you don't mind. And now picture yourself in those hands. And then consider those are God's eternal hands. And there you are. You see yourself there? Hands that fashion whole starry galaxies in this universe. And more wondrous, hands that were made to a Roman cross to redeem you, to redeem me. You see yourself there? And with that, just close your eyes a moment as we pray. Lord, thank you that we're in your hands. Thank you that though there are times in our lives where there's such an ebb and flow, there's such a, a though, and yet. And we all experience it. And thank you, Lord, for the surprising response of your prophet Habakkuk. Thank you for his gutsy and gritty expression of faith as he exulted in you and trusted in you and rejoiced in the God of his salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you, in his life, are the same in ours, that you are the strength of my life. That you make my feet sure-footed like the mountain deer or the mountain goat. And you place us in high places where we fellowship with you and we trust in you. Thank you, Lord. This Thanksgiving week, Many of us have everything going just great, going fine. We hardly have a need. And those can be vulnerable times for us, Lord, because we can forget and, and take for granted all of that good. And so help us not to be in grace, but rather thankful people, grateful people to you. And others of us, Lord, are conflicted and troubled by various circumstances and we need to reach down deep Lord and have a gritty gutsy kind of gratitude that trusts in the Lord God our sovereign Lord so we thank you either way we can join Habakkuk and exult in the God of our salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. As you know from having read the bulletin that Walter and Dawn and, and Sweet Lenora, this is their last Sunday with us. And um, we have enjoyed getting to know them and get better acquainted with them over the months and I've appreciated them and some of the kindnesses and the acts of thoughtfulness that they've done among us. Walt's brought a couple good messages from this pulpit that we've enjoyed and appreciated. God has a different plan. And um, Dana Bonstrom's going to come up and read a letter that's from the director of Village Missions. And then Dana's going to lead us in prayer for them as well. And by the way, when we, we want to be God's people of grace and God's people of generosity, 
we want to support Don and, and, uh, and, and Walter and, and Lenora. Uh, they'll be loading their truck tomorrow on their way back to family in Oklahoma. And we want to send them away with, with our blessing. And so we are going to have a free will offering right after Dana uh, leads us, uh, shares the letter with us and leads us in prayer. And then we'll have that offering so that we can give it to them to help supplement their needs and uh, for the trip ahead and getting, getting on their feet back, back in the home ground of Oklahoma. So Dana, if you could come, appreciate it. This says, Dear Kettle Falls Community Church family, thank you for your investment over the years in helping prepare people to serve the Lord as village missionaries. Your patience and grace have powerfully influenced those who have served among you. I want you to know that Village Missions has made the difficult decision to end the residency with the Youngs as a church family you have done your best to assist the young family in the, in the preparation process. The Lord calls and directs his servants, and part of that work occurs through the wisdom he shares and gives to spiritual leaders. Over the last six months, we have prayed for Walter and Don and assessed progress in preparing for their ministry. We have concluded that the Lord is directing them in a different way means of serving him. Please pray for them as they adjust to this change in how they saw God directing. I sincerely appreciate your loving investment in the youngs and allowing them into your lives. May you have peace knowing that God has used your investment in this residency as part of his work, even though it is not concluded as we have hoped. Thank you for being a precious part of God's work in the life of this family. It's Dr. John Adams, Executive Director of Village Missions. So, if someone, feeling, if someone feels led in prayer, go ahead and then I'll finish up here. Father, thank you for 
bringing the youngs to us for the time that they have spent with us. We pray for Walt and Don and Lenora as they go back to Oklahoma. May it be a safe trip. May you go before them and prepare their way. May they recognize your hand and their provisions and safe travel and direction in, your, in uh, their lives. Lord, we, we pray that they will sense what we have planned for them as far as service to you in Oklahoma. And we thank you for the opportunity to the opportunity to share our lives with them and their lives with us for their time here in Kettle Falls. Lord, we trust in you, and we know that they trust in you, and we 